Hello everybody and welcome back. In this lecture we're going to be continuing our discussion of memory topics when we focus on, as I mentioned before, a more application-based approach to memory research. If you remember back to our last class, we spent a lot of time not only defining where memory research came from, but a lot of the major terms and concepts that memory researchers explore. Doing this was critical so we could transition to today's topic where we look at not only shortcomings with our memory, but also some techniques and information about how to improve that memory. I always feel like this is something we need to cover in an intro class because I understand that the vast majority of you might not ever take another psychology class again after this one. Understanding how your memory works and ways you could potentially improve it is something that I think everybody can benefit from. And for those of you that are thinking about this class as a major still, keep in mind that we're going to be covering some really interesting, useful stuff that highlights some of the research that people studying memory have built off of and some of the things that could potentially be paths to explore as you progress. So let's get started with this topic on memory and issues relating to it. To do this, to introduce us to some memory concepts, I thought we'd have a lot of different activities that we could do throughout the day. And some of these activities are going to be pretty close to what we did in our last class, where we read a list of nonsense syllables and asked to recreate it. But for the vast majority of the activities that we're going to be doing, there's going to be some type of tweak to them. Obviously, you can just ignore the tweaks and not do what you're being asked to do and just test your memory the same way we were testing it before. But to highlight a lot of the concepts that we're going to be looking at, I encourage you to not only participate in these activities that we're going to be doing, but do your best to follow the instructions to their fullest. If you do, hopefully some of the effects that we're going to be talking about will not only be something you'll learn about, but something that's apparent in your own performance on these tasks. So let's get started with the very first activity. In this first activity, what I'm going to ask you to do is just listen to a list of words that I'm going to read. There's no extra things that you need to do while I'm reading the list of words, no extra things you have to do after. I just want you to listen to the list of words, and then when I'm done, write down as many of them as you can recall. So let's get started. Get that sheet of paper or computer open. We'll be started in just a couple seconds. Here we go. Ring. Shoe. Time. Ear. Bike. Bed. Corn. Lace. Table. Rock. Dog. Rack. All right. If you're participating, please try to write down as many of these as you can recall. All right. Moving on to the next one. I'm going to read you a list of words again. This time, what I'd like you to do while I'm reading this list of words is try to write down as many as you can. Sorry, needed to pause there. Try to write down as many as you can uh, while you're also, well, actually, I take that back. I'll write them while you're uh, listening to Gosh, write them while you're listening to this, but write them after you've listened to them while also saying the name of a good friend in your head. So for example, if you know of a person named John Smith, what you'll do is as I'm reading this list, I'll be saying the name John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, John Smith, over and over and over again while I read you this second list. When we're done, as I kind of mumbled through, what you need to do is then write down the number of words, well, not the number of, but the words that you can remember for this list while you were going through this activity. 
I know it might be a little bit more challenging to continually say your friend's name in your head over and over again while you're listening to the list, but if you want to bring out this effect, that's what you're being tasked to do. So please, give it your best shot, and to make this really work, what I'd like you to do is start saying that friend's name in your head now. I'll start the list in just a few seconds. Plain. Cat. Broom. Car. Mouse. Brush. Truck. Bear. Mop. Train. Ant. Rag. If you've been doing this, again, now is the time to write down as many words as you can still recall. All right. I assume if you want to keep writing, you can pause me. So we'll continue on with the next activity. This one's going to require a little bit more work if you want to do it. This one involves me reading you another list. But at the end, we're going to play a game called the Roll of Sevens. What I'm going to do is give you two numbers. And what you need to do is count backwards from the first number to the second before writing anything down on your sheet of paper or your computer. So again, list two numbers. The first one will be larger than the second. And you're going to count backwards by sevens before you write anything. So if I gave you, say, 35, 7, you'd say 35, 28, 21, 14, 7, and be done. This is what you're tasked with. Now, I'm pretty sure the two numbers I'm going to give you are going to work out, but if you find yourself in a point where you've counted backwards by sevens and somehow not landed on the number but gotten below it, just write down anything you can still recall after that point. But please, just like the last one, the only way this works is if you really do the activity. So let's get started. Get your paper out, get that computer screen up, whatever it is. In a couple seconds, I'll start reading the list. Again, I'll give you two numbers at the very end, and I want you to count backwards by sevens with those two numbers. Here we go. Heart. Shout. Time. Blank. Belt. Flash. Stain. Tree. Stand. Stamp. Board. Book. 7244. If you haven't started writing, write down as many as you can recall. All right. If you need to pause me, do so. But for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to move on to the next slide and explain why we did all those random things that we did there. What all of these activities we're getting at is how when we're trying to remember stuff from, say, a list or a story or something that we're presented, and all that information is weighed equally in our heads. Instead, what we often see when people are presented this information is something that we call the serial order, or sometimes you'll see it listed as the serial position effect. It's a fact that when we do read a list or watch a movie, we tend to remember the things at the beginning of those movies or lists or stories pretty well. We call this the primacy effect. And we tend to also retain the stuff at the ends of these lists or movies pretty darn well. 
it's very easy to see the primacy effect in that first list of words that I read. My guess is that the vast majority of you, probably in the first list of words, wrote down the word ring, shoe, or time, the first three words that there were. In fact, I'm guessing many of you wrote down all three of those words. And I'm guessing that a lot of you struggled with the middle stuff. Bed, corn, and lace, three words straight in the middle, probably were a little bit more challenging for the vast majority of the class on that first list. I'm not saying that everybody couldn't remember those. In fact, there might be a few of you sitting there noticing that you remembered all of those. But as an aggregate, if we looked at all the people in the class and how they performed, I can all but guarantee that the first three words are much easier to remember than the middle three, and that's what the primacy effect is all about. This also works for stories, movies, chapters that you read, anything that's presented in a specific order. That primacy effect is pretty darn robust. But it is important to note that there are ways to remove it. That's what we were doing in the second activity. When I asked you to say that friend's name over and over again in your head, what it often does is it kind of distracts you. It lowers your ability to kind of latch on to that beginning stuff the same way. It means, I'm guessing, that many of you didn't quite remember plain cat and broom as much as you remembered ring, shoe, and time from the first list. You know, plain cat and broom, the first three words in the second list, were there, presented first, just like before, but because of that distraction, we tend to, again, this could be individual differences, but as an aggregate, see that those words are a little bit tougher to retain because of that distraction. This same idea also holds for the ends of lists and ends of presentations, at least for a short period of time. We call this the recency effect. My guess is if we looked at that first list that we read, most of you also remembered the words rock, dog, and rack, the last three words I read. That's what the recency effect highlights. But much like the primacy effect, we tend to be able to get distracted and kind of eliminate this recency effect if the right conditions arise. Like, say, you're asked to repeat or run through a list of numbers that are counting backwards by sevens for some inexplicable reason. If you were, say, to ask to do that, you might find that remembering the words stand, board, and book is for some odd reason significantly more challenging. Right? This increased challenge is all about removing some of the things that make this recency effect possible. Uh, the kind of lack of these things being set in your head at that moment is a big challenge when we're trying to exhibit this recency effect. And it also highlights something that's pretty interesting to note with this recency effect. And it's the fact that as time passes and new things pick up, the deterioration of this recency effect is pretty predictable. The primacy effect tends to stay over the long run. Those first scenes from movies, those first bits that you read in a book or a chapter, those things tend to stick with us for a very long period of time unless we're distracted while we're engaging in them. But when it comes to the ends of stories, the ends of chapters, the examples that we read and that we think are going to stick with us forever, over time, those things decay at a much more rapid rate. My belief is that it's probably related to some of those other distractions that we start to encounter after that information's in our head. It's all fine, expected, but it's also important to note that as a result of this, people do tend to overestimate how much they remember some of the stuff at the end of lists and chapters and other things. How does this relate to you? Well, the next time you're studying for an exam, now there's a bevy of research that suggests that students tend to overestimate how much they know about the material at the end of a chapter or the end of a presentation and tend to study it less and then therefore do worse on that material on exams simply because this recency effect has decayed. Like I said, not only interesting for majors, but interesting for all of us who find this, I guess, applicable to a large number of aspects of our lives. Let's move on. Now, to explore this next topic, 
going to do an odd pairing of activities. First activity is what I call my fruits activity. You'll understand very well why we call it our fruits activity in a couple seconds here. Um, but just note that in this activity, I'm going to read you a list of fruits, and then I'm going to give you another set of instructions. Unlike the previous ones, you're not going to know what these instructions are until I read them after the list. So please, just do your best if you want to try this out to listen to the list and wait for the second prompt. It'll all make sense as we progress. So get that sheet of paper out or computer up. We'll start in just a second. Here we go. Apple, pear, blackberry, apricot, plum, pomegranate, lime, grape, blueberry, peach. All right, here's where things get interesting. Now I'm going to read you a second list of fruits. I want you to, again, try to remember everything from this second list, and then I'll give you a third set of instructions. So here we go. Strawberry, banana, orange, pineapple, cherry, mango, lemon, cranberry, kiwi, papaya. All right. and what I'd like for you to do to test your memory on this is write down as many words from the first list you can remember. So write down all the ones from the first list of fruits. Do not write any from the second list. Let's see how well you do. Now, I can't test you like we could in an in-person class. Pause me if you need to. Uh, if we were in an in-person class, I'd be asking people to identify ones that were from the first list, if they got them successfully, and maybe ones that they accidentally identified from the second list. We'll just check our work later if you'd like to by reviewing these presentations. But my guess is that we got a pretty interesting effect just from this activity in this manner. To move things along a little bit faster, we're going to do our next activity that I call the flowers activity. Again, for this to work, you need to listen to me first read a list of words and give you a second set of instructions. Do not do anything until we go through the second set of instructions. Get yourselves ready. And here we go. Daisy, carnation, geranium, marigold, orchid, pansy, violet, poinsettia, sunflower, honeysuckle. All right, now much like the last time, I'm gonna read you a second list. And the second list just so happens to also be a list of flowers. Just like before, do your best to try to memorize everything from this second list, but also keep hold of that first list. Here we go. Tulip, daffodil, iris, hibiscus, rose, lotus, Water lily, lavender, goldenrod, mistletoe. All right. On this one, what I'd like for you to do is try to only write the words from the second list. See how well you do. If you need to pause me, do so. I'm going to advance to the next slide, assuming that well, you'll catch up. All right. So what did these activities have to do with memory effects? Well, what we're looking at in these two activities are examples of something that memory psychologists call interference. What we tend to see when people are presented information is 
not only is the serial position effect matters, but how much contrasting or conflicting information we have in our heads also matters. What we tend to see is that when there's overlapping information, say you're learning material from two similar classes or learning competing information about different topics, almost all of that material that we're learning in conjunction with each other is be a little bit harder to process. We call the inability to process new material because of past information that's competing with it proactive interference. This is what we saw in the second example we had. One would think that you should be able to recall the entire list of flowers from the second list with how short that list was and how overlapping they were. But my guess is many of you missed a number of those flowers from that second list because you were still grasping on to that first list and maybe even remembered a few things wrong from which list things were on. This is what proactive interference is all about. And there's lots of real-world examples of this, not just stuff we find in labs. One of my favorite examples of this is something many of you might encounter as you progress through your years in college. Many of us in our freshman year tend to remember pretty much everybody's name perfectly. We remember the names of most of our teachers, our classmates, remember our schedules, without almost any challenges whatsoever to do this. And as we progress, something really interesting happens. It's it more and more challenging to learn new names and new faces and new schedules. Well, that challenge is related to this proactive interference. We also see something that's kind of the converse of this called retroactive interference. We also sort of lose old material as we're trying to pick up on new stuff. That's what we saw with the fruits example that we had first. And it's something that, again, we see in lots of real-world examples. One of my favorite is to ask incoming freshmen to try to recall what their lock combination was from high school. Well, most of us probably had the same lock for all three or four years of high school. Trying to retain that number, bring it up, the thing that we used every day, might suddenly be very challenging. We'd also ask you to remember, say, what your schedule was in a senior year or some other year. And my guess is that since you're on a new schedule now, that information is lost on you. As new stuff becomes prevalent, old stuff starts to become forgotten. And oftentimes, these two types of interference effects make, again, just trying to remember competing information, both the old and new, very challenging, which again produces some interesting, unexpected effects. One would think that if we're taking multiple classes in the same area, that it'd be easier to learn that. But sometimes, especially if the information's competing, deciphering, when it is we were supposed to remember and how we're supposed to differentiate things can become a challenge. Again, it highlights the amazingness of memory. Now, to really appreciate how good our memory actually is, I thought we'd do one last activity. This one really should be the easiest one that we're going to do in this class. All you're going to have to do is listen to a list of words with a very prominent theme in it. And as I'm reading this list of words, I want you to just sit there listening without anything else distracting you. When it's done, I want you to write down all the words that you still have in your head. No pauses, no delays, no extra steps. I'm pretty sure most of you can get all of these, so do your best. But feel confident this is something you can do. So here we go. Dream. Dresser, pillow, rest, night, snooze, bed, dark, eyes, shut, sheets, purple, blanket. Write down as many as you can. 
move on to the next one, but please do continue writing as many as you can. All right. My guess is if I was able to survey the class, most of us would have been done doing really well on that activity. In fact, most of you probably would insist you got pretty much every one. I would check. We've got what, and some of us would probably immediately identify purple as an odd one since it didn't seem to fit the theme of every other thing. Probably a lot of people would remember that one pretty well. But another thing that could potentially have impacted our memory is something called the reconstruction effect, where when we have themes, things we tie together, we tend to find a way to create some story out of it, some semblance of it, even if that thing we create starts to become completely imperfect. This is something that was discovered by cognitive psychologists a number of decades ago. When people try to remember stuff, and the best way to do it was to create some type of script or story or idea in their heads. And in doing so, they tended to forget a lot of peripheral stuff or combine things that weren't there. The classic prompt that was used to examine this reconstruction effect from many decades ago was something called the War of the Ghost. You might encounter this in a future class. We don't have time for it in this one, but... Just know now that it's this very unusual, conflated story of individuals being recruited for some type of war, but there's a lot of nuances to it that make it very atypical. We have our normal way of telling stories. We have our normal series of events that occur. And the chaotic nature of this story doesn't fit the mold that most of us have in our heads when we tell a story. So what researchers will do to highlight the reconstruction effect is they'll tell this story to one person, ask them to retell it to another person, ask them to then retell the story they've been told to another person, and get to a point where the last person re-explains the story to the first, only to find that their take on this war of the ghosts, this story, was very imperfect and also oftentimes very well, morphed, changed in an unusual way. There's a lot of belief that this is happening all the time when we're presented information. In fact, I would surmise that a number of you might have succumbed to this reconstruction effect on that last list. If you look over your list of words, I'm guessing approximately, if this class is representative of other classes, or between 50 to 75% of the class remembered a word that was never on the list. The word sleep, which I'm guessing about half of you are staring at right now, was, I promise, not a word I said, yet many of you probably have it written down. What many cognitive psychologists have argued is that, again, like everything we've talked about, these things are not just things we find in the lab. There's lots of real-world applications to this. Oftentimes, we remember stories or events and things that we've encountered in an imperfect way because they don't fit some specific framework we have in our heads. For all, creating that framework can help us remember more, but it makes our memory imperfect, is what the reconstruction effect suggests. There's also research that suggested that things like leading questions can cause us to distort past memories just as much. There was a champion in memory research named Elizabeth Loftus who spent a number of decades arguing that kids especially are very susceptible to suggestive questions. As we age and think our memories are more pristine, our ability to remember what it is we're experiencing now and what it was we experienced from our past it's extremely malleable. One of my favorite studies was when she asked people to recall a specific moment from their childhood when they were lost in a mall, only to find out that many of these people who swore after being asked to recall this, uh, that they were actually lost in a mall, whose parents admitted or suggested that, that they never had been lost in a mall or other public place. 
I butchered that description, but just understand the gist of Loftus's research was based on this notion that this reconstruction effect is happening all the time. And it's leading to us having very imperfect memories of specific events, especially if they're situations that could lead us to distort what it is we encounter. One thing that can be very closely tied to this as well is something we call the hindsight bias, where we do have specific motivations to distort our memory of how we foretold or, I guess, expected certain events to play out. It might have been a victim of this at some point in your life when you watched a sporting event and maybe didn't, weren't sure who was going to win when it started after the game ended were convinced that the team you were cheering for the team you expected to win was the team you well anticipated winning all along never mind the wishy-washy thoughts that you had in your heads or maybe you recall a specific friend that you had a falling out with and now when you look back on it, you swear you were always acutely aware that a breakup might be a possibility. The odds are pretty good that you're probably falling victim to the reconstruction effect to an extent. This is just how our memory works and this little nuance to it that has lots of real world applications. So this might lead many of you to say, oh, how do I improve my memory then? How do I get better at converting information from my short-term memory to long-term memory? How do I keep the critical things in my head and organized in an effective way? Well, there's lots of different tools and techniques that cognitive psychologists have developed over the years. But one of the most prominent ones, one that again I feel is in <laughs> inherently necessary to cover in an intro to psych class, is a model called the Levels of Processing Model. It suggests that the best way to store information for the long run in our heads is to engage in something that the theorist who introduced to called Craig and Lockhart called deep processing. Deep processing is when we find ways to connect information that we're being told in kind of elaborate forms say we hear an example of something we find ways to tie it to our own life or we find ways to you know, ask questions about that specific topic the levels of processing model goes into a lot of detail that we don't have time to cover in this class but just understand that this deep processing which is contrasted by something called shallow processing where we're just trying to rote memorize stuff has proven, even if it's tough to pin down what deep processing actually is, to really help in not only short-term retention of information, but especially long-term retention of information. Why this is the case is still up for debate. Some have argued that it primarily works just because you're spending more time trying to retain that information in your head. Others have argued that maybe it's because the neural pathways that you're forming when you're coming up with these bits of information give us better access to that information through multiple routes. Or it could just be when you're doing it, you're convincing yourself that you probably care more about this and that extra effort, that extra attention is often sufficient to keep that information in your head. Regardless of why it works though, I strongly encourage you to try this out if you're trying to find ways to retain more information in your classes. Thinking about stuff deeply, finding examples that really apply to your own life is an immensely powerful tool when you're trying to retain large amounts of information in a class like this or any other one that you might encounter down the way. It's much more effective than that basic rote retention that some of us might have unknowingly fallen into at some point in our academic careers. How else can we improve memory? What other things seem to enhance our ability to recall bits of information that we've been told? A lot of things past the levels of processing model have shown effects, just significantly less robust ones. 
one of the prime examples of this is something that we call memory dependence. It's this really interesting finding that suggests that whatever situation, internally or externally, we're in, we're presented information, can serve as a cue for that information when we're asked to recall it later on. The classic memory dependence activity involves people being presented information in one language and being asked to recall it in either the same language or a different one. Mind you, in these studies, the people that were asked to do this were bilingual, so they weren't trying to recall words from a language they'd never heard before. In these studies, what they found was that bilingual individuals that were, say, read a list of words in French, were much more capable of recalling that list in French than they were in English. And this was not a conversion issue. This simply was a situation where it was a lot easier to reproduce stuff in the same medium that they were presented it in. We also see this in lots of situational factors. We've seen numerous studies to highlight how if students are tested in the same classroom that they learned information in, the performance on those tests is not necessarily dramatically better, but it is a little bit better, suggesting that the cues of the lighting and the sound and their situation in the classroom can sort of jog their memory just a little bit. There's also lots of research that shows that your emotional state, your mental state, and maybe even the chemicals that you have in your body can have an impact on your memory by serving as cues or prompts to the information that you acquired while you were in those states before. So if you're studying late at night while consuming massive amounts of caffeine to stay awake, now there is some research that suggests that being on that same amount of caffeine when you take the test can actually help you do a little bit better if you can prevent yourself from shaking and losing the ability to focus. There's also some research that suggested that, yes, if you're drinking alcohol, you can sometimes recall things that you did while you were drinking that alcohol a little bit better the next time you're drinking that alcohol, but I do need to forewarn you before you start thinking about this for the classroom or future life events that memory consolidation is just tough in general when we're consuming things that, well, sort of inhibit large sections of the brain. We've talked previously about how alcohol works, so I'm not going to go into details of that in this presentation, but know that that's probably not your best path forward if you're trying to do well on an exam. But it does, again, highlight the really interesting effect that we call memory dependence. There's some other things that have also really shown to improve memory. Maybe not quite as much as deep processing, but again, have shown to increase retention. One of the things, which again, is very applicable to students in college, is to take lots of breaks while you're trying to accumulate information. Technically, we call it increasing the number of learning sessions that you have. Why would this help? Well, there's lots of reasons why taking breaks probably help. One of the things that it allows you to do is engage in that deeper processing that we talked about earlier. It's really hard to engage in deep processing for, say, an hour-long presentation, or in some of your classes, two or three hour long class. But if you can break things up into five, 10, 15 minute increments, it can allow you to process stuff much, much better. It's actually something that's been encouraged of many online classes where we try to find ways to and of give students chances to pause or give them a chance to just take a break whenever they need to. Those breaks can help sustain that deeper processing that really does help with retention. It also, theoretically, if you're going through your studies, can increase the primacy and recency effects that we talked about earlier when we discussed the serial position effect. Now, it's probably important to remind you that you know these Primacy and recency effects are somewhat temporary, especially the recency effect. But if you're, say, studying for an exam, they shouldn't be overlooked. Those midnight cramming sessions where you're trying to get through everything in one night might help you a little bit for the short run. But if you want to retain that information for a long time, 
that is a horrible way to go about it. If you are looking to keep stuff that's a little bit more random in your head, one other final thing we should mention are these things that we call mnemonic devices. Little tricks, tools we can use to retain information that's somewhat disparate a little bit better. The classic mnemonic device that people use are acronyms or, or phrases sometimes that help people retain stuff through kind of simple terms or simple statements. In psychology, one of my favorite acronyms we use is the word OCEAN. And to be more specific, in personality psychology, somewhere down the road in this class, I'm going to mention that your personality spans the ocean. And you're probably going to look at me a little confused. Well, I guess you're not going to be looking at me because this is online, but you get the gist of it. You'll be a little confused, not really understanding why I say your personality spans the ocean. And then I'll go on to explain that this term, this word ocean, encapsulates the big five. Openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. The five traits that many trait psychologists measure people on to try to get a sense of how they might behave in different situations. That simple word can make that five traits a lot easier to retain in your head. You can also use simple phrases, catchy things, to make more disparate items a little bit easier to understand. So instead of making a word, we make a statement. As a student of music when I was a kid, the phrase, every good boy does fine, or every good boy deserves fudge, depending upon which teacher I had, was ingrained in my brain. Some of you might have had it too. This phrase, of course, deals with the scales and trying to memorize how to go up them for different instruments that we have. For those of you that have never encountered this, <laughs> don't sweat it. You probably have your own phrases that you've developed to learn how to do specific things. That's what mnemonic devices are about. Learning easy tools that give us access to more disparate, or even discrete stuff that we've encountered. Another thing we can do is find ways to take these things that seem disparate and make them into something that sort of makes sense. Out of the deep processing that we talked about before. We call this, as a mnemonic device, chunking. I can actually give you two examples of situations where you could have potentially chunked information before. If we go back to that first list of words I read, ring, shoe, time, ear, bike, bed, corn, lace, table, rock, dog, rack, that list we read at the very beginning of class might have seemed like just a random collection of words. But if I read the list a different way, I'm guessing most of you would have gotten all of the words on the list suddenly. If I read it like this, shoe, lace, time, table, ear, ring, bike, rack, bed, rock, corn, dog, suddenly it doesn't feel like a list of 14 words. It seems like a list of well, just seven words or seven items. It's one of the ways that chunking works. I'd also say order things by categories. Instead of plane, cat, broom, car, mouse, brush, truck, bear, mop, train, ant, rag, like we read in the second list, I could have read the list like this. Cat, mouse, bear, ant. Car, truck, train, plane. Mop, brush, broom, rag. And by parsing these out into specific categories, suddenly that 12 words becomes significantly easier to retain. That's what chunking is all about. These are the basic mnemonic devices, creating phrases or using chunking. There's also very specific ones. We might hear of very specially named ones that have very specific applications. One of the ones that you might want to know about is something called the method of loci, where you pair new stuff that's tough to keep in your head with things you're extremely familiar with. A classic example of this is when you're, say, shopping for just a few groceries. What you can do, if you don't have a list to write down, is just 
pair those items up with something that you're familiar with, like the house you grew up in. So if you need milk, you can just close your eyes and imagine yourself pouring milk all over the front entryway of that house. If you need, I don't know, bread, you can walk into the kitchen and stuff bread down the sink. And if you need peanut butter, you can walk to the television in the living room and smear peanut butter all over it. And if you need, I don't know, eggs, you can go into your sibling's room or your parents' room and just put a ton of eggs in their pillowcases and just head to the store. Instead of trying to remember each of those four items discreetly, you just close your eyes, go to your house, and immediately notice the milk that you need because it's all over the front door. Then you go into the house, walk into the kitchen and see the bread in the sink. You go to the living room, look at the television covered in peanut butter in your parents' room where you see eggs stuffed into the pillowcases. And all of these things make those four discrete random items much easier to remember. Of course, with this technique comes a forewarning that if you do it a lot, you're going to start running into those interference effects we talked about earlier. And this is where we get to be full circle and recognize that all of these ideas in memory are not just disparate things. They're highly interrelated, and they're just parts of the conversation that memory researchers are having to better understand this very elaborate thing that we call memory. I think this is where we're going to end the class, but a very good spot where we've been able to cover the topic of memory, clarify some key terms, and hopefully give you lots of take-home applications, even if you're not interested in psychology as a major. Hopefully from there, we can now move on to something that's very closely linked to memory, a topic called intelligence. And we talk about kind of individual cognitive skills that sometimes do pertain to well, differences in memory capacity. I don't want to give away too much, so for now, I'm going to bid you adieu, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. So take care. Goodbye.